Hello friends, it's Pastor Steve. Uh, this video recording is of the first week in the class on the geography and history of Palestine in preparation for the trip to the Holy Lands and for anyone who might be interested. This first week, we're gonna focus specifically on uh, the geography of and the topography of uh, the Promised Land, the, the Holy Land, Palestine, and its location within uh, the larger theater of the Middle East and to see how uh, the land itself contributed to the story, sort of as an extra actor uh, that helps shape uh, the story of the Bible. And so this first slide shows a common picture of uh, the Fertile Crescent, uh, where civilization first began, along with Egypt, at least in the West. And in that Fertile Crescent, it's known for that because you have the waters of the Tigris and the Euphrates, uh, you have the Sea of Galilee, uh, this is the area where uh, the rain fell, the crops were grown, animals could be found, the, where the towns uh, were located. It was also kind of that highway or, or area that uh, peoples traversed as they migrated from one place to the next. Uh, Abraham, we know, begins in the land of Ur, of the Chaldeans. And you'll find Ur is down in that purple section on your uh, slide and right next to uh, the water. Now you'll notice uh, in that little inset that uh, scholars believe that the Persian Gulf extended farther inland at the time of Abraham. It was over the thousands of years since that the land is silted up and filled in. So there's more land <clears throat> and what we know is Kuwait. It's actually kind of a buffer land uh, between Iraq and Iran today and uh, actually, the war uh, between Iraq and Iran in the 80s, much of that happened in that alluvial plain delta area uh, that used to be underwater. Um, when we think about Ur of the Chaldeans, uh, we think about uh, some of the uh, buildings that were built there. One of the more notable ones were called the ziggurats. Um, and this is a ziggurat located near uh, what was considered uh, Ur at that time. It was about 200 feet by 150 feet by 100 feet high. Uh, you think about chapter 11, just before we are introduced to Abraham, there's a story of the Tower of Babel, uh, this tower that's built into the sky. And, and if all you know of any building is, you know, the one floor uh, hut that you grew up in, uh, to come across a ziggurat or this a kind of pyramid building would truly be uh, awe-inspiring uh, and would uh, kind of led to that reflection uh, about uh, our hubris as human beings. Anyway, uh, that ziggurat would be located to where tradition has, and the scripture says, uh, Abraham uh, was born and began his life. Uh, but we know that Abraham went from there uh, up to the top to the land of Haran and then made his way down to the promised land. Now to give a sense of the scope or how far Abraham had to walk, I put uh, Iowa there in the midst of that Fertile Crescent. Everything is to the same size. So we're, uh, it's fairly comparable in distance. And so when you think about, well, what is that, you know, what would that travel look like? Well, it might be like starting in Peoria or maybe a little bit to the east of Peoria there in Ur, working your way up to the very top of the Fertile Crescent, which where Heron was. And that would be like, I don't know, going up to Bemidji. I think it, you're beyond Brainerd. I think you're up in the middle of Minnesota up to Bemidji. And then you have to walk all the way down. You're in Omaha. Actually, you're a little bit to the west of Omaha. You'd be more like in Lincoln, uh, Nebraska. Uh, and so that would have been the distance that Abraham would have had to walk over time, about a thousand miles when you add it all together, because nothing is a straight line anymore. The other thing to know is that Iowa would be in the area of the desert, the Syrian desert, the Arabian desert. It was a dry and desolate place where animals and people uh, did not live and did not traverse. And so uh, they would make their way and they would avoid uh, that area in the middle. When we think about this Fertile Crescent, you can kind of see it in the nations that existed at about the time uh, of when Abraham, uh, or actually when um, Israel left Egypt to make their way into the Promised Land, just about then. Now, you see all of these nations, you think everything's well formed. Actually, they happen more in time. Uh, we hear of the Hittites uh, more in uh, the time of uh, 
the um, um, patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We hear of them uh, early in the time of the judges. We, If you remember uh, Uriah, who was the husband of Bathsheba, was Uriah the Hittite. So they had actually been uh, uh, hired uh, by uh, the Israel kings, David and Solomon, to uh, perform services. The Hittites were uh, in uh, often in competition with Egypt for influence in the area. And, and actually, Ramses II, I believe, uh, one of his big battles was against the Hittites. It happened oh, around the uh, Damascus, I believe it was. So they were uh, the principal power. The other powers of Mitanni and Assyria and Babylon still had to emerge. I mean, so don't think of them as existing altogether fully at the same time. They each happened in turn. At first, it was the Hittites, um, and then Assyria, and then Babylon, and then to the west, uh, to the farther east, would have been Persia. Something else uh, to notice is that uh, the link between Egypt to the south and those nations to the to the north. <clears throat> it was that kind of buffer ground. We see the town of Tyre there. Uh, Israel was just to the south of that, and that buffer ground became sort of the battleground of influence between the nations to the north and Egypt to the south. So Israel was in some ways in the unfortunate position of sort of being in this uh, zone of combat. Uh, and the nations to the north and Egypt to the south were always seeking alliances or control over that middle ground, which would have been the land of Israel. Uh, so as we go through the story of the Old Testament, we find uh, how that battle gets played out again and again in the life of Israel, especially as we look to uh, Assyria and Babylon, um, and as we know Egypt, you know, with the Exodus. Oh, moving on. There we go. Just kind of backtrack a little bit. Uh, we have Ur, uh, where Abraham was born. I don't think it was... I'm not sure how they could be so precise of 1996 BC, uh, but it was uh, somewhere in that time, maybe more, I think closer to about 1700 BC, give or take. Abraham and the family migrated up to Haran uh, in the north, uh, which would be almost in the land of Turkey uh, that we would see. And then from Haran, uh, Abraham received a call, uh, a sense that his life, his destiny was not to be there, but was to be someplace else. And God called him to a land. He said, I will show you the land and and you will have many descendants and you will be a blessing to others. And so Abraham left Haran, made his way down to Damascus and Shechem. Now, the thing that we need to be mindful of is Abraham did not have a map. He did not have GPS. He did not know where he was going. God said, I will show you a land, follow me. So Abraham really stepped out uh, into the unknown to follow God. When Abraham gets to Shechem, he's there briefly and discovers there is enough water. Uh, it was a period of a drought there, so they had to go back farther down into Egypt uh, to buy uh, food and provide water for his uh, flocks. And after a period of time, then came back to Israel. I think he had to go one more time and then back again. So life in the promised land was precarious. Um, uh, water wasn't always consistent and there wasn't always a good grazing land. Um, one of the things about Abraham is that he never did buy or have much land. The only land he actually owned were the grave plots for himself and Sarah, his wife. Um, you know, of the of the children, uh, he had two. Uh, uh, Isaac uh, was the one that uh, uh, became uh, the father of Jacob and continued. Um, but Abraham didn't have a big family even at that time. So Abraham really is an amazing story of living into the promise of God, even when it is not fully present or his to have. Uh, yet he lived into that promise. Um, as I made a mention, Abraham went to uh, Egypt. There was sort of, there's this enduring draw of Egypt for the people of Israel. Um, Abraham uh, goes to Egypt to uh, 
for food and uh, for himself and for uh, the sheep. He goes back. Um, it's uh, in the time of Jacob. Uh, Jacob, uh, his son jo uh, Joseph, is sent to Egypt not of his own will. He's sold there by uh, to slave traders by his brothers who didn't like him. But eventually, uh, there is a famine, a drought that is in the land of uh, Israel. And so Jacob and the family all make their way to uh, the delta, the Naya Delta called Goshen, where Ramses was in the process of building uh, a large uh, city uh, to sort of rival Thebes and uh, Luxor. Uh, they become slaves in Egypt, uh, sort of enforced labor. Moses then arises uh, that word Moses actually is an Egyptian word for being drawn from the reeds or the water. Um, Moses will then lead his people out of Egypt. There will be this long time in the Sinai Peninsula, down at Mount Sinai, and then in the wilderness of Zin, wandering around for 40 years before they finally make their way back to the promised land and, in a sense, start over again. But it's not just simply those trips that matter. When we look into uh, the history of, in, in the book of First and Second Kings, you'll see sort of this repeated uh, uh, draw to seek alliance with Egypt, that somehow Egypt would be their protector. Often what would happen, Egypt would just simply protect them until it wasn't convenient anymore, and then they would just sell them off to uh, Assyria or Babylon in the north, and sort of as a sacrificial uh, country to uh, uh, take up the energy and the time of the invading hordes from the north. <clears throat> so it never was a, um, uh, uh, a safe or secure relationship between Israel and Egypt, but there was always this draw. And then we think about Jesus. You know, when uh, Herod goes after Jesus, Joseph will then take Jesus and Mary into Egypt. And there's that phrase, out of Egypt have I called my son. So that connection with Egypt uh, continues even into the New Testament. Then I have a picture here of uh, sort of the landforms of Palestine, and I've compared it to something that you know we might be more familiar with, and that is Eastern Iowa. And again, everything is to scale. So you kind of get a sense that from the Dead Sea or Jerusalem up in the mountains all the way up to uh, the Sea of Galilee is a bit like from Iowa City going up to uh, maybe Waverly would be a, about the distance. Um, and, uh, you know, where the stories of the Bible happen is pretty much in that middle area, the high plateaus, the Dead Sea going to the north, maybe 130 miles north to south, maybe 30, 35 miles uh, east to west. Uh, we'll talk about uh, those landforms and kind of what they mean in a little bit. But just to kind of get a sense of orientation here, uh, the green uh, to the left along the so uh, shore is called the coastal plain. Um, the uh, hill country is, um, actually there's sort of the, the yellow that you see that is called the Shephelah, kind of the hill country. What they call here the hill country is actually the Judean plateau. And then you got the Jordan uh, River Valley and then um, the Transjordan Plateau, which is actually even higher uh, than the land of Jerusalem and Israel. There are four landforms uh, that uh, kind of shape uh, the landscape. Uh, to the left is what's called the Coastal Plain. Uh, the Gaza Strip is along there. The Philistines lived along the Coastal Plain. Israel really never claimed the coast much at all. Uh, they're not a seafaring people. Um, but the only person I know of that gets on a boat is Jonah, and it doesn't go very well for him. So Israel left others to be the seafarers, the Phoenicians to the north, uh, the Philistines. I'm not sure they were much of a seafaring people, but uh, they had the coast to the south. And then you have what we call the Shephelah, which is sort of this rolling hill country, a transitional land between the coastal plain and the Judean plateau. The Judean hills or Judean plateau really is that strip of land where many of the Bible stories happen. Oh, I should ma mention the Shephelah. Uh, what happens in the Shephelah in that hill country is you, you think the battle between uh, 
uh, Goliath and David happened there in the hill country because that, it was sort of the battleground between the Philistines and uh, the people of Israel. Um, uh, the, the hometown of John the Baptist was there in that hill country. Emmaus was in that hill country. Uh, more of the stories and the names that we're familiar with in the Bible, uh, and particularly in the Old Testament, happen high in the Judean plateau. You got Hebron, Jerusalem, Bethel. Um, they are all in kind of that higher uh, land that we call the Judean plateau. And then farther to the right is the wilderness of Jordan. And you have Masada, uh, just off the Dead Sea in the wilderness of Jordan. Uh, David was hiding from Saul in the caves of the wilderness of the Jordan. Jordan. And then Jesus, um, uh, when he went into the wilderness, went into the wilderness of Jordan uh, to be tempted by Satan and to test his call. Uh, so there you've got kind of the four places. We'll take a look at that a little bit more. Uh, the coastal plain, as I said, runs along from north to south. The Philistines are to the south. The Phoenicians are to the north. But there's also an area... Um, called the Jezreel Valley that sort of extends from the coastal plain over to the Sea of Galilee. And that would be also an area of agriculture that the Israelite kingdom to the north took advantage of. Um, uh, the coastal plain, uh, how shall I say? Actually, the interesting thing is when um, uh, in the Balfour Agreement, when the Middle East was divided up and then when uh, Israel was given land to form a nation, it was a land along the coastal plain that they were given. Uh, it was actually good agricultural land, uh, but um, um, that was not tr traditionally the land of the Bible. It was not the promised land, um, but they took it because they would take you know whatever they could get after World War II. Uh, but there's kind of a reversal in terms of what they received was what's not really talked about in the Bible. And uh, the West Bank, uh, which is talked about in the Bible, is not, uh, that was meant to be for the Palestinians. Uh, we'll talk about that in, in another time. The Shephelah is this transitional land, as I said, battle against the Philistines. Goliath happened in this hill country, home of John the Baptist and Emmaus, and it leads up to the highlands or uh, the Jordan uh, plat or Judean hills. And to the south of the Judean hills, I think we've got Hebron Hill here, it is dry, and the thing it, what you see is you see the rocks. Uh, there is some uh, precipitation to afford some vegetation, but even in the time of Abraham, it was not very densely populated. Uh, it was kind of open space where Abraham could settle his flocks. Um, when you go to the north, uh, which is what we call Samaria, uh, but it was part of uh, the... Um, lands of the Old Testament and of the judges and of the tribes of Israel, uh, you see that there is more um, vegetation and there's a lot of variation in the rainfall and what the land can support. Um, and then you've got the Judean wilderness, and that is that transition between Jerusalem, as you say, you go down to the Dead Sea. And um, Jerusalem sits at about 3,500 feet in, uh, above sea level. The Dead Sea is 12, 1,300 feet below sea level. So you got about a 5,000 foot drop. And it's on the backside, so the rains rarely come that far. And it is dry. Uh, Masada was located in this area, hiding place of David. And Jesus was tempted there in the wilderness of the Jordan. <coughs> Now I've got uh, a map, and it's a little different. So if you kind of imagine the map of Israel, and we just sort of turn it to its side, so we can kind of see along uh, sort of from the top is to the left, that's the north, uh, the south is to the right. And if we look at uh, the green is what we call uh, the coastal plain, uh, and those are the lands of Philist uh, the Philistines, and... Um, Israel itself never in the Old Testament had much, uh, not much happens there in the coastal plain. But something else about that coastal plain, as you can see, because it's flat, it served as a highway. It was called the King's Highway, actually, uh, for the kings and the armies from the south in Egypt and the kings and the armies from the north of Assyria and Babylon. They would come uh, over the Golan Heights down into that valley, and, and this was uh, often a place of battle. Um, 
or farther up into Damascus, but you had to go by here. Um, the thing then to observe is that uh, Jerusalem is up on the Judean plateau, and so is Samaria and the kingdom to the north. Those areas are really kind of uh, protected or out of the way from where most people uh, walked or made their way, and that probably protected uh, Jerusalem and uh, the kingdom of Judea and, and, and of Israel because they were off the beaten track, I guess you would say. Um, the uh, up to the um, if you look at the Judean or the plateau, that kind of higher area, uh, you can see sort of how it is sort of drawn away or withdrawn from um, uh, sort of the traffic of everyone. Um, let's see now. Um, the other thing uh, to say how geography gets played in the story, we talked about how the Judean hills or the plateau is this long kind of plateau across the top and then it drops fairly quickly down into the River Jordan and the Dead Sea. So there's a story of Abraham and Lot and they are battling, you know, there's just not enough water to supply uh, the flocks for the two families. And so Abraham finally draws Lot to the side and, and they go to the edge of the plateau and they can look down into the River Jordan. And they see it's green with trees and uh, you know, vegetation and and you turn around and you, you look at uh, the Judean hills and it's rocky and bare and tough. And Lot says, well, which one do you want? And uh, Abraham says to Lot and says, I, you know, I think I'll take the easier grazing down in the river valley. Uh, so Lot takes his family down there. Abraham stays uh, up on the uh, plateau. Um, what seemed to be a good deal for Lot turned out not to be so good. Uh, we think of Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, but think more also just simply Lot is in where a lot of people are and there is competition uh, and there is danger and threat and he does not survive. Abraham up on the plateau, uh, there are many people that live up there and uh, he may be in a place that nobody else wants, but then it becomes a place that uh, is a protection and safety for him. I don't know if you can see, but there is sort of this, uh, um, you see the two green lines that surround the two landforms to the south and the north. And that is uh, really kind of reflects sort of the uh, Israel to the north, the northern kingdom, Judah to the south, uh, the southern kingdom. And you can see how, where they come together uh, around uh, Jerusalem. Um, Actually, I should say that area is now marks out the West Bank. I should say that. I sorry, got that wrong. Uh, that green line marks out the West Bank, and there's sort of this gap in the middle for Jerusalem and, and Bethlehem. Uh, to the north, uh, Haifa uh, is where Mount Carmel is. It's, Mount Carmel is located sort of on the um, uh, inside of that hill. It was at Mount Carmel. We'll get to that where... Elijah battled with the uh, prophets of Baal. Um, let's see here. You'll notice how um, the Jordan River really marks a boundary between Israel and the kingdoms uh, to the east. But then you'll see there's this distinction between, between the kingdom of Judah and the kingdom of Israel. And there was a river, there was a kind of a valley or, or a gulch uh, that existed between that also served as a natural barrier. So it divided the two kingdoms. I always tend to think of the history of the Bible, the Old Testament, as primarily the history of Jerusalem. Well, actually a lot of it has to do with the history of Israel to the north. And in that time uh, between those two kingdoms, the kingdom of Israel to the north, they had the wealth. Uh, they had uh, land that you could irrigate and uh, for agriculture. Uh, they had more of the industry. Uh, Judah to the south was a high, rocky, out of the way place. Uh, in terms of economic terms, it was the poor, weaker of the two countries. And really, the only thing that saved it from being overrun by the kingdom of Israel was that it was just simply out of the way and uh, difficult to navigate. Um, so that perhaps that's the one thing to note is that uh, is 
if you were to read the newspaper in that time or to the Wall Street Journal or whatever, uh, the kingdom of Israel to the north uh, was the industrial uh, agricultural uh, nation that had uh, riches and privilege. And the kingdom of Judah uh, was small potatoes in comparison. One of the other things that uh, always struck me is why uh, did the kingdom of Israel break off from the kingdom of Judah? I mean, what was the inclination? And what we find in the Old Testament is there's always this kind of uh, uh, sense of two minds. Um, how do I mean that? Um, that there was always sort of this separate sense of identity. Saul uh, came from the north. Um, David was from Bethlehem in the south. But even before that, the stories of Abraham happened mostly around Hebron and uh, Kadesh Barnea, uh, or Beersheba in the south. Um, and uh, the stories of Jacob, his grandson, more of those are associated with the north, uh, Bethlehem or Bethel, where he uh, laid down for a dream and uh, or to sleep and had that dream uh, in Bethel. Um, so the stories of Jacob happen more to the south, Abraham to the south, uh, north and Abraham to the south. Um, even the kings, where they come from, there's the north and the south. It's interesting, when Solomon died and uh, his son Rehoboam took over, uh, Solomon was also known for um, very high taxes and conscripted labor. And the kingdoms or the tribes to the north asked for some relief. And uh, Rehoboam said no. And there's this phrase where he says, uh, to your own tents, Israel, for what do we have to do with the son of David? And in that, there was a sort of each to their own, a, there, the sense of separate identity that was already somehow baked in the cake and uh, really plays out for uh, most of the history of the Old Testament. We'll, we'll see that when we get to a timeline in another week, but just to see these two uh, countries in, in some ways defined by the land that, that shapes them. Uh, uh, the river valley, or a kind of a gulch uh, between the north and the south, the Jordan River, and then uh, the uh, Sea of Galilee. Uh, to the north, to the very north, we have uh, Jezreel and the Valley of Jezreel. Uh, think about Jezebel and uh, it was a productive uh, place of agriculture. Uh, the Sea of Galilee is even farther north of that. The interesting thing I noticed is that, you know, the Sea of Galilee f uh, plays a big role uh, in the Gospels, but I cannot remember a story that happens around the Sea of Galilee in the Old Testament at all. Another indication that the people of Israel, they were not water people. They were shepherds, uh, maybe, uh, uh, they had uh, grape fields or olives, uh, but they did not fish. Um, and uh, so the Sea of Galilee does not play much of a role at all in the Old Testament, if at all. Uh, you, you see Mount Carmel uh, there, that's where um, um, uh, Elijah uh, battled the prophets of Baal, looking out over this fertile valley. You have Megiddo there. Megiddo uh, was a fortress, and uh, often battles would happen uh, in that valley. Um, so uh, Armageddon, it comes from actually the Hebrew Har Megiddo, and, uh, and it ref uh, the reference to Armageddon in, in Revelations actually goes back to this place called Megiddo in uh, the Valley of Jezreel. Here we are looking out over uh, the uh, uh, Valley of Jezreel from Mount Carmel. Um, it was a marshland in that day. Uh, we know that people to the north had chariots were of the Iron Age because uh, when Elijah said to Ahab, you better get in your chariot and get home before the valley fills with water and rain that Ahab got in his chariot. and made his way home to the, uh, his palace. Um, Israel was always a little bit more uh, 
economically uh, advanced uh, with chariots and agriculture. It was on Mount Carmel uh, that Abraham, uh, that Elijah had battled with the prophets of Baal. So that's something else to be said of this time and place is that when Israel came into the promised land, it was already occupied. And uh, so much of the history of Israel will be uh, a religious history or uh, a history of uh, faithful obedience and that they were always attracted to um, people of Israel were always attracted to other religions and uh, much of it had to do with simply kind of a sense of technology uh, you know if you're living next to your Canaanite neighbor and, and they grow better crops than you eventually you're going to say well how do you do that and they would then talk about uh as part of what they did was their worship of Baal and how Baal was a, a god of agriculture. And uh, it was always a temptation uh, for the Israelites to forsake uh, Yahweh and the covenant of Mount Sinai and to see, uh, seek for something else uh, so as to grow better crops or somehow have a better life. Again, we go back to uh, the... Um, uh, that kind of relief map. And uh, just to talk a few minutes about the devastation of Israel and Judah. So the Assyrians uh, will uh, uh, conquer the land, uh, the kingdom of Israel to the north in 720 AD. That's about 200 years after the collapse of the United Kingdom. Uh, but the Assyrians will then take away into exile uh, the king and all of and the court and anybody who had some ability, professionals, teachers, lawyers, uh, uh, business people, but they left uh, the Samaritans, uh, the Israelites, who were in that highland, perhaps because it was just too hard to get to and bother with. Those Samaritans remained there uh, and were then the forebears of what we know as the Samaritans in the New Testament. Um, but their existence there happened uh, out of what um, Assyria did. Uh, the second thing to, be, to note about Assyria is uh, they were fairly brutal in their colonization of land. So what they would do is they would, uh, they came and conquered the land of Israel and they took literally thousands, tens of thousands of people uh, shackled uh, to other of their lands. And then they would bring uh, the slaves or the people of those lands into the land of Israel. Israel. So there's a lot of mixing up of populations that happen. That was a way for to kind of keep things under control. If people don't share a language, if uh, they don't share a background, then they wouldn't as likely rise up against their uh, overlords or masters. Uh, but Jerusalem to the south was spared. Now, Tilgath uh, Pileser from Assyria did come down, did threaten to take over uh, and conquer Jerusalem. Uh, but the walls of uh, Jerusalem were too strong and they laid siege, but then eventually there was internal insurrection and disruption within the kingdom of Assyria. So they just simply left, hoping to return, but they didn't because Babylon then came on the scene. Uh, Babylon in 587, about 550 years later, then came down, took over uh, the land of um, Israel to the north, and then... Uh, took over and laid siege to Jerusalem. Um, Jerusalem uh, sought an alliance with Egypt. There's Egypt again. Um, and that angered the Babylonians. And so uh, they sought not simply tribute, but uh, they sacked uh, the temple and uh, destroyed the temple and sacked the city of Jerusalem, tore down its defensive walls, uh, essentially sort of took it apart brick by brick and took everybody into exile, not only once, but came back and did it again, it pretty much devastated the land. Uh, it's, it's amazing. We'll come to this again. Amazing to think how there could be a people that survived uh, these two de deportations and somehow there's a sense of identity in place. It's nowhere else spoken of and it happened, has happened nowhere else in the history of the world, but it does happen here. So we're going to be, it's a little bit about uh, the land and landforms of um, Israel and Judea and their situation and how they interplay with some of the great powers 
and what and next week we're going to look at kind of a timeline of of this and just to see what made possible for Israel to be formed and to become a kingdom and uh sort of uh, kind of get a big picture of of um uh, the kingdoms and what came to play so we're going to uh look at that next Sunday uh look at the kind of the history and timeline uh of of the Bible and uh, the surrounding areas so Uh, Thanks for listening, and I wish you well. Until next week, bye-bye.